We're happy to have the people who are here who are interested in the, in the promotion tenure process, and, and we want to thank all of the people who uh, uh, who are willing to be on the panel. They're experienced academics who have served on promotion tenure. Uh, the promotion tenure committee and know the process pretty well. So without further ado, let me introduce Hai Gochagan, who is our moderator today. Thank you, Charlie. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'll just do some opening statements uh, and then introduce the panelists. You know, this is part of the union's uh, effort to, um, to really share information and find a common place to, for faculty to meet and discuss issues that are relevant beyond just contract issues, beyond issues that have to do with, with uh, details of, of uh, a 10-year, you know, whatever, whenever the contract comes about. Um, secondly, I think it's also important for us to have a chance to discuss issues as they're coming up, so that the faculty has sometimes more of a chance to, to have their voice and say in debates and, and, and uh, consideration when issues are being debated. And we do these, these forums on different kinds of topics. This one is on an information on one, but you know, when we do have discussions closer to the timing for the, let's say, the online uh, committee, then we'll have a panel to discuss online issues so that we have a chance to impa impact uh, the decision-making panel that the university has put together. Um, this panel then is, um, I hope it's useful to all of you. I, I think we do this every year, once a year, bring together a panel on tenure. Um, and it's, it's the central focus of, of, of a lot of uh, faculty, that the whole process of going up for tenure and achieving tenure. There is, you know, the, the similar process for staff, but that's not the discussion today. We'll be talking mostly about, we'll be talking only about uh, faculty getting tenure. Let me introduce the panel to you, and the, the format is each of the panelists will speak for three to five minutes or so on their experience of, on ten, of tenure, as well as their own area uh, and, and rules and expectations for tenure. You know, tenure varies in, in some ways across the university at the department level. I think it becomes more similar as you get up to the uh, college level. And, and then at the university level, the, the expectations seem to be more similar across the board. So we'll talk at all those levels, from the diversity at the lower level to the similarities at the, at the higher levels. At the far end of the, of the table is <coughs> Renee Hoogland. Renee is a professor of English and editor of Criticism and senior editor-in-chief of Macmillan Handbooks on Gender. Their areas of interest include literature and culture after 1870, visual culture, critical theory, American studies, comparative literature, modern and contemporary art, gender and sexuality studies, queer theory, postmodernism, film and media studies, popular culture, and new body theory. Her most recent book is a Violent Embrace, Art and Aesthetics after Presentation. She is also the author of Lesbian Configurations from Columbia, Uni Columbia University Press and Elizabeth Bowen, A Reputation in Writing from New York University Press. Renee also received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2014. Renee's BA and MA are from the University of Amsterdam as is her PhD on Modern English Literature and Feminist Theory. Renee, welcome to the panel. Next to Renee is Robert Arking. Bob Arking is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. He earned his BS in Biology from Dickinson College in 1958 and a PhD in Biology from Temple University in 1967. His research involves the mechanisms that underlie the onset of senescence in Drosophila. Uh, Bob has served in various positions in the Gerontology Society of America and recently published the third edition of his Biology of Aging Observations and Principles. He is also the Contract Implementation Officer and Vice President of the Union at Wednesday. John, uh, Bob, thank you for coming. Next to Bob is John Corvino. Uh, Dr. Corvino is Professor and Chair of Philosophy. Uh, he has been at Wayne State, however, for over 17 years, initially as a lecturer. He is the co-author with Maggie Gallagher of Debating Same-Sex Marriage and the author of What's Wrong with Homosexuality, both from Oxford University Press. John is currently working on a book, Debating Religious Liberty, Tolerance, and Bigotry. John has earned the Distinguished Professor of the Year Award from the President's Council of the State Universities of Michigan and a 2004 Spirit of Detroit Award from the Detroit City Council for his work on behalf of the LGBT community. 
John earned a BA from St. John's University and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Texas at Austin. John, welcome. Stephen Hillman uh, is a professor in the College of Education and program coordinator of educational psychology. He is also a director of the Laboratory for Research on Adolescents. Stephen Hillman's academic interests center on behavior therapy. Um, <laughs> Stephen has the ability to move objects. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Hillman's academic interest is centered on behavior therapy, developmental psychology, and research design, research design. And his research is focused on adolescent risk behavior, stigma, and learning styles. He has received the Outstanding Graduate Mentor Award from Wayne State University. Stephen, can you stop that? <laughs> 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 His BA is from the University of Connecticut, uh, Master's and PhD from Indiana University, and he is a licensed psychologist in the state of Michigan. Stephen, thank you for joining us. So if we can begin then with a uh, little introduction uh, of, of the tenure from your perspectives, each of you, and you can take it from any angle you'd like. I'd like to finish with Bob uh, and have a chance to talk about the union's perspective as well after, after uh, the other perspectives. Yeah, so maybe Renee, can you go with the first one? I didn't prepare any statement. Anyway, um, I have served on um, the Tenure and Promotion Committee in my department a couple of times, and last year I served on the University Committee, which was very, say, edifying and interesting. Um, and I have to say that I think we need to emphasize the differences within the different kind of fields, in the different kind of departments, uh, on what counts as like a tenure case, a sustainable tenure case, and what does not. I learned a lot because I had to learn all these things about what happens in a medical school or what is, counts as like a substantial kind of tenure package in biology or physics, about which I don't know anything at all. Um, but my experience in that committee was that uh, everybody is actually really eager to learn, and that everybody on the committee is actually eager to learn what they don't know yet, and to see how these kind of factors kind of play out across disciplinary uh, boundaries. Um, I have to say it was a really positive experience. I thought the whole process was very conscientious and very careful, and uh, there was the only thing that I want to say for across the board, letters are key. Letters, so letters of reference, letters of support on every single level. Um, the only kind of, I'm sorry with the problem, the only kind of problems that we encountered last year were contradictions in the letters between the different levels. So the chair and the dean, for instance. When there's a conflict there, that is when the committee actually kind of says, oh, what is going on here? Let's talk about this a little bit more, look into this more carefully. So you want to make sure that you kind of feel, have a good sense of, of what your referees will actually do and what your relationship with the dean and with the uh, with your chair is. Um, I think most of all, the focus on that committee is on research. Um, not research just accomplished, but also is somebody, you know, does, does somebody appear to be actually have, having a, an active research agenda that promise for the future. But like tenure is not like, well, partly it is kind of a, a, a consolidation of your previous accomplishments, but it also is the university, and it's kind of, sounds kind of cool, but is it worth the university's while to keep you on? So um, that's that's an important point that your that your research agenda actually promises to kind of move into the future. Um, the other thing uh, that I was surprised by, but actually also appreciated, is that people there are always a couple of people from the um, uh, education department who actually look very very carefully at teaching. Um, so I think on the whole, research in a research one university is like the most important factor, I guess, mm -hmm. um, on which to base your tenure case. But it doesn't mean that everything else is kind of like marginal. Um, all these aspects are taken very carefully into account, service, teaching, um, being a good citizen of the department of your school or whatever your program. Um, I don't know. 
Um, I think I'll leave it at that for a minute. Thanks, sir. John, and you were chair as well from the chair's perspective, in addition to what you were talking about. Right. So um, I guess I want to just say a little bit about my own path and, and my perspective now. So I came here actually as a lecturer. I was not on the tenure track when I arrived and was a lecturer and then senior lecturer for several years before I went on tenure track. And in addition to um, being chair for the last three and a half years, I was recently promoted to full professor. So I've, I've been at various different stages. And looking back over that time, over the 17 years I've been here, um, a couple of things um, stick out to me. Uh, one, and this is something that I would emphasize both to people who are going up for tenure, but also to departments, that mentoring is a thing and that we need to place emphasis on that. Um, and it, I'm glad to see that the university now uh, has more formal processes in place to ensure that new faculty members are assigned mentors and that mentoring happens. Um, I would say to those of you who are on the tenure track to uh, take advantage of those processes, but also to take advantage of other opportunities for mentoring um, outside of your department, from multiple people in your department, um, from multiple people around the university, because those different perspectives can be very valuable. And one of the things I've seen go wrong, just um, looking uh, around the university, talking to people, observing cases over the years, is that sometimes uh, there's no mentoring going on. People say, oh, they know what they're supposed to do, and, and people don't always know what they're supposed to do. This is a, uh, a challenging, difficult process, and you know, we come at this you know, out of graduate school, and we don't always know all the things we're supposed to do. But also, um, people just not taking that advice, right? People who, who are, are given advice by mentors and not really taking that to heart, not really following through on that. So there, you know, there are responsibilities of departments to provide mentors and to make sure that mentoring happens. There's responsibilities of candidates to, to take advantage of that and, and to, to follow through. And, and I've seen that go wrong at times. Every department should have um, published, usually right on the website, factors for tenure and promotion. And of course, different disciplines are going to call for different things. Some disciplines are very much book disciplines. My discipline is not, and this is something that we are always very careful to emphasize when we have people going up, that we are much more a journal article focused discipline than a book discipline. Um, even that being said, most departments, at least my own department, uh, doesn't want to do this. And I think most departments don't want to put like actual numbers down if you need to have this many articles. Because there are lots of other factors that go into that. The length of the publications, the, the prestige and difficulty of the publications, uh, the reach of the publication. And this is another reason why getting input from multiple people can be valuable. Usually, you know, we try to sort of suggest to people, here's a range you should be looking at, but that can vary. My own case was sort of an interesting case because while I did not have many journal articles, uh, I had some journal articles when I went up for, for tenure, um, I did have a lot of book chapters, but those book chapters were often in books where the other contributors were full professors with fancy titles from fancy places. And uh, of the journal articles I did have, you know, at least one of them was in an extremely prestigious journal, so you know, my path was maybe not the standard path, but it was a an opportunity for sort of me to be a good version of me, and that's going to be true for a lot of people. There, you're going to have your own unique way of doing you, and just make sure that your way of doing you is at least somewhat in line with your department's expectations of what they want for tenure and promotion. Two other things I want to emphasize um, to people who are on this uh, track: one is the power of networking, uh, at least in our own discipline, and I'm sure this is true in many disciplines, going to conferences, presenting your work, meeting people, both as an opportunity to get feedback on your work, which is very important, but also as an opportunity to meet people, um, some of whom may later invite you to contribute to things that become valuable research projects for you, uh, some of whom may eventually be called upon by your department to be letter writers for you, and letters are important, uh, it's a very important part of the, the process. 
Um, so I would encourage people to take advantage of those opportunities. And I know that some of us are, are not as inclined to do that as others. Some of us are more social. I tend to be a pretty social person. But you know, other people, you know, I, I know even when they go to the conference, they sort of go to their things and then they, they rush back to their rooms. And I say, no, no, go, go to the bar. Talk to people. Uh, it's important. Um, and also, finally, the, the power of saying no. Um, because all of us have multiple demands on our time, but particularly when you're on the tenure track and you are trying to stay on schedule and get your publications out and do your research, um, you will often be asked to do <coughs> other things in terms of service and, and so on. And it's important to do some of those things, but it's also important to set limits uh, because otherwise um, uh, you end up stretching yourself too thin and don't set yourself up well to be here over the long haul. And of course, once you do get tenure, I, I, I think this is true of many departments, but once people do get tenure, we are more inclined to then ask them to contribute and do service. Um, so that's, that's something you have to look forward to. We're going to ask you to do a lot of work after, after getting tenure. Um, but even at that point, you know, because of the further promotion process to full professor, because of other demands on your time, it's important to know that saying yes to certain things always means saying no to other things and to be able to, to decline when, when you are overextended. And then finally, I want to close on a very personal note. This is something that I've been bringing up uh, lately as I've been talking about these sorts of things. I think for many of us uh, as academics, our work life and our sense of identity are really tightly intertwined. Um, and that at times can really mess with your head. And it can mess with your head at, at strange times. It may mess with your head during the tenure process because, um, well, it's a process where you are undergoing scrutiny and evaluation and that sometimes doesn't feel very good. And at the end of it, you could have a permanent job for life, which would be really cool, or you could be like, bye, please pack up your desk, which is, which is awful. Um, and so there's a lot at stake there. But it can also turn up at other times. I found two years ago, I had, was just completing my second book with Oxford University Press and went through a really serious period of depression that made absolutely no sense in terms of where I was in my career. And it was only, you know, after some time of, of really sort of thinking through that and working through that and going through therapy and, and other things that I realized that part of it was that I had set out to accomplish these things and I had accomplished them and then I really had no sense of what I was going to be doing for the next 20 years or so. Um, and that was really disconcerting. And I bring this up because I think that as we are going through the tenure process, a lot of us are taught to be strong and look strong and not show any kind of weakness. Um, but that because of that, sometimes people don't seek out help for these personal things that can be deeply intertwined with professional things. And the university does have resources uh, in terms of support, in terms of counseling services, in terms of um, uh, insurance coverage for, for things like that. And I, I made it a point now when I talk about these things to tell people to not neglect that aspect of their life as well uh, because it, it, it's part of the overall picture. John, thank you. It sounds like a very good generous, generous advice to junior faculty as well. Um, and Stephen. So this is what you do for the next 20 years. <laughs> I've been on the University Tenure and Promotion Committee three times as assistant dean in my college, and on what we call the personnel committee, which is the tenure and promotion uh, and the salary committee, um, probably 75% of my career. Uh, and you do get asked to do a lot more than just your research and your teaching. So this is part of what you've already started and have to look forward to. <laughs> My I also have a new book contract, so I'm, I'm, oh, feeling, good. I'm feeling good, good again. Good. <laughs> so my tenure process was, frankly, a long time ago. Uh, I think it's not much different. Uh, I've heard a lot of comments uh, from my uh, uh, faculty uh, predecessors who have let in. And I was thinking, what, what do I want you to take away from this, and what do I want to say a second time? Um, Number one is about mentoring. There are two kinds of mentors. There's sort of the academic mentor who will tell you maybe what journals you should look for, uh, how to go about it, review your uh, article as it's submitted. Uh, but then there's another kind of mentor. 
And I think the best one for that is probably a person who's two ranks above where you are, not threatened by your success, maybe was even on the university tenure and promotion committee, and certainly on your college or department's committee, so that they can articulate for you, does teaching matter? Does your research matter? Do the letters matter? Does your service matter? What should it look like? help protect you from being asked to do things that won't matter. And I just know, and I can speak um, uh, probably too specifically about my own college. See, we are not departmentalized. We are a college, which is essentially a department. Uh, and so we do have people who have done way too much emphasis on service, thinking it would matter. In the end, it will not balance lack of scholarship who put too much time, it's hard to say you can put too much time into teaching. And teaching does matter. And Renee's right, there are always people from education on the university committee who read those descriptions of your teaching philosophy very carefully. And when they're well done, which is very often the case, will comment on it and will congratulate you. And when they're not, they'll point that out also. Teaching does matter. If you have a $40 million grant, I guess it probably matters a little bit less. Okay? But it does matter. Service, yes. Get to know your colleagues in your department. Do some. Do the things that are not as time-consuming. Don't isolate yourself. But scholarship matters. This is a research university. It does matter. So one of your mentors should be somebody who knows your college, knows your department, knows the process, and help you can help you to say yes to some things and help you say no to other things. I know people personally, unfortunately, who were very good, who did just as John said. They ignored it. They thought they knew or they listened to the wrong people. And they were not successful. They could have been. In our college, the personnel committee reviews every file every year for non-tenured people and writes a letter. What you're doing well, what you need to work on. As an assistant dean, I wrote another letter, the same thing. Some people I know have ignored them. Or if they said I don't agree with it, they didn't go to the author and say, what do you mean? These are important pieces of information. The university invests a lot of time and money in recruiting and hiring junior faculty. The departments that hire them want them to be successful. Unfortunately, I know too many stories. Not everybody gets tenure. As I think Bob will describe, we want a fair process. Did you want me to talk about the university level? Yes, I was say, you've been three times? I've, I've been on, I was on with Renee this last time. Before I was ever on it, you hear stories. I have to tell you the stories are all incorrect. It is a wonderfully collegial group of people. What we do, because some of you will have this, I want to say wonderful opportunity, which it is, but it's the hardest working committee in a condensed period of time. You will get approximately 80 to 100 portfolios of approximately 100 pages apiece. You have to read every page okay. of everything. You will read every one of them because not only are you interested, but you do know the seriousness of the responsibility that you have. But I think things have changed. In my time of being on it, I can tell you that the vast majority of people whose records come before that committee are supported because the colleges and the departments are doing their work. Years ago, I heard the stories. Just send them up and see what the university committee will do. It's not the case anymore. The work is done below. But the committee takes this work seriously. And of the files we read, I'm telling you, they're about, you know, it's all the letters, it's the resumes, it's some sample publications, it's your teaching portfolio, uh, it's your set scores, it's your philosophy concerning your research. And we learn a lot, those of us who are not in your discipline. 
Somebody's in your discipline. Uh, Listen, we're sits, not. Sits with a computer and Googles every single journal to see the the ranking of the journal. The no, that's power. no, that's usually again the record all right. Oh, but if it's not, people do have their computers, and uh, I don't know. I don't think this is a confidential thing because we all have our computers. And uh, we had somebody on the committee one year, uh, and he was able to determine how many books were sold. Of somebody who wrote a book, how many libraries purchased them. Mm -hmm. If you don't have information there, and we want to know how many times it was cited, like that. Okay? But the records that come before each college and to this committee are usually enormously complete. And that committee is very, very fair and very supportive of people who are qualified candidates. It is truly a delightful group to work with even though it will take all of your time for about two and a half to three months. Thank you, Steve. You should have that pleasure someday, mm -hmm. really, because it means you are likely a full professor and respected by the group. So, uh, Bob, if everything were always perfect, there wouldn't maybe be a need even for a, for a union grievance officer. That's true, but unfortunately, we're busy. Um, <laughs> first, I agree with most of everything my colleagues said. I'd like to give the first a personal note. Bit, and then they talk more about this from the union point of view. I've been here long enough to, to I can do a longitudinal study on the contrast between the atmosphere that surrounds this process today, which is open, transparent, um, positive efforts such as this form, such as the posting of uh, the process all over the computers and websites and books that are handed out and all that is just completely opposed to the way it used to be back in the dark days before when mimeograph was really, that was the cutting edge stuff. Um, and it was a policy book someplace in the chair's office. And yeah, you'd go in there and ask him, but if you said, look, I want to look at the policy book because I think you told me wrong about that policy. This could be a bad move, career move on your part. And so there are lots of policies I knew nothing about and sort of guess and got gossip because nobody else knew either. It was sort of a people stumbling in the dark, and some bad decisions were made. Not mine, but other people's um, And that's different. It's very different today. Very open, much more supportive, much more, uh, I think you used the phrase, that, that, that the importance of each individual system professor is, I think, recognized. People are not thrown away, as they were before, perhaps. And so that's an important point. I think that's, that's all to the good of the administration and all the changes, whatever, that led to that. The, uh, the, speaking of this from the union point of view, and one of the most important sentences in this whole process is the that there's no right to tenure, but everyone has a right to a fair comparison, fair consideration, sorry, fair, not comparison, not at all. Tenure is an extraordinary privilege, and it is an earned privilege, uh, and so you, there is a tough process to go through to get it. Once you get it, it is, as John said, a job for life. You can do what you want. There's probably no creature more free on this earth than a tenured full professor. I feel that. And so I think that's cool. But you have to go through this process. And so if someone is turned down for tenure, the union will not grieve, cannot grieve by contract. We can grieve the process if there's process is not being followed, but not the decision because the decision is really your colleagues on all these committees, and I've served on departmental, uh, college, and university committees, and I can think of only a handful, two or three decisions which I disagreed with, which I thought were not fair, uh, if that. And, uh, and so people, you're being examined to make sure that you can, in fact, uphold the scholarship potential that you showed, and that the scholarship means something, if we're just adding, exhibiting a known work and putting more, more zeros on decimal points to it, that may not be sufficient to be opening new, new, asking new and provocative questions or opening new fields of endeavor and so forth. But if the scholarship is, is of good, good and good quality, is thought highly of by your peers, and you seem to be broaching new ideas, new directions, then this is probably the kind of person that the university wants. The other thing you should notice is that the whole process is laid out in the union contract. It's not just an administration protocol. The union is the, the guardian of this, if you will. I mean, this is historical. 
but uh, clearly that the, TN, the tenure and, and promotion protocols are not just in administrative proceedings, but are under the hopefully wise guidance of the university, of the, uh, of the, the union. And this is our main reason for being, is making sure that the processes of uh, tenure and promotion and the other sort of due processes laid out in the contract um, are maintained so that the process and other related processes are fair and reasonable and lead to basically good decisions. The better, the fairer the decisions, the fairer the process, the more likely the decisions will be the correct ones. And you know, our, our idea is that if the process was followed, then whatever that decision is is most likely the best one. If the process wasn't followed, there was some prejudice, there was a, something wrong that went on, then we can question that process. But even when the union questions that process, that does not earn tenure. It means the process starts again from that point, or something like that. You still have to go through that process. Um, and as I mentioned, we can't grieve a negative tenure promotion decision. We never get anybody who has to grieve a positive tenure decision. It never happens. And the other thing I would suggest, is, as several other people pointed out, the factors that describe what it is you need to, the standards that you need to come to. The, uh, in some departments, this is very specific. Uh, you must have X journals and X papers in Journal A and Y, journal, y papers in Journal B and so forth and so on. And they just elaborate it. And others are rather vague. You must have an international understanding or background or something. And, um, but the important thing for assistant professors and so associates who are going out for promotion is, in fact, to know what the factors are. And they're written in a general form in the book, but there are detailed factors, each of which should be reviewed each year by your department and voted on by the department and have to be enforced for at least that coming year, which describe in some more detail how, how this, what this is. And even there, so in biology, they, they say something a little more specific than the, the contract language here, but even there, you want to talk to people, your mentor, your chair. This should come up in your descriptions, uh, discussions on annual review, for example. What does this, what does this phrase uh, be well thought of internationally or something? What does that mean? And you, is, how does it mean? Should I publish in a small journal or that journal? Should I go to this meeting? And you brought up in a very important um, you want to get a better sense of what it actually means in terms of how you publish, what you publish, where you publish, what your strategy is. And, and you need to know that. One example, for example, in some departments, it's um, the candidate can vet the list of outside letters, outside reviewers will be asked. And because you may have a personal feud with someone or whatever, you can, some people, some departments allow you to vet, cross off those names or have those names crossed off. You can't do it. The chair can. Other departments won't allow that. And so this, these are things that um, you need to know beforehand. And in informal discussions with your chair, I mean, you may well be asked for a list of people who, you know, who are good or whatever. They, people may look it up themselves. Um, but it's up to you to, to know the process. And there's no way, given the transparency and the openness that's out there, there there's, it's really not difficult for you to find out this information. And you should network and talk with people. Uh, a beer is good, loosens people up sometimes. You can chat with them. Um, and so I think uh, this process, keeping this correct and keeping it good, is, is one of the main things that the, this union does. And we got it very important. Thank you, Bob. Let me ask you, uh, those of you here, um, is there anyone interested in going to full from an associate? Is that an issue for anyone? Why don't we talk about that a little bit as well? Then? Um, any of you who on the panel has handled that as a case? Uh, have you here? Oh, we've had nine. And, and, and John, have you handled those cases at all? I just went through that. that, that <laughs> 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 we handled his, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Before we go to that, I just want to say one thing about something that Bob just said. I thought, and this is something one can look up in the contract, because the contract is online, it's actually sitting on the table, that um, we actually had to present candidates a list of possible letter writers, which is always going to be larger than the list of people chosen, and that they contractually had the right to strike, I think, up to three names from that. Is, is that not the case? It's not in the language. It's, it's not in the language not itself? Okay, maybe it's just in the, the in college the guidelines. Department. You, you, department. you never get to know who writes for you. So this you well, that's true in our department as well. You don't know, but you do know a list of uh, a list from which the people will be chosen. I'm sure in my department. 
Interesting. I didn't realize that was true. Yeah, that's a, that has been a long contention across the part for many years. Uh -huh. uh, in uh, political science, you get to strike names that uh, you object to, but you can't strike all the names. That you <laughs> I see. Good to know. Okay. Sorry to interrupt the floor. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, I have a question on this point. Um, I was tenured elsewhere in a state with a strong open records law, and I saw all the letters. And you saw all the letters? I saw all the letters. Yeah, after, after the fact, you said? No. After, after the fact? After, after the, the process fact. was over? After the fact. External letters and the chair's letter and the dean's letter. What is visible to candidates here? Redacted letters. As in the identity is masked? That's right. So I, I asked my chair because I was applying for a grant and I thought, to, you know, maybe I can ask the people who already wrote for me so that they don't, you know, I don't ask people to do unnecessary work. She refused to give me the names and she said, I will never give you those names. That's idiosyncratic. I think in other departments you might have Wait. Well, it might be your chair at that point in your career, right? In our, in our contract, we have um, some strong language to access your um, records. Um, anything post-employment, you know, like, um, so not like letters of reference before you were hired, but whatever it was uh, in, put into your file after. Um, and the evaluator letters um, on promotion of tenure, they, can, they have to provide. It's in our union contract. Um, and uh, so... If you ask and you don't get it, it could be an issue, a grievable issue. Okay. So, so you have the right under the, not under the law, but under. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there is a I law that says you have the right to see personnel files. Right, right. That law is restrictive around evaluation letters. Our contract gives us more than the law provides. So let's talk a few minutes about uh, going up to four. Uh, how different is it from going up to associate what's the things to look for and so on? Well, <clears throat> the expression for uh, tenure and promotion to associate uh, is about promise. So the committees that review are looking to see whether the candidate has established him herself or herself as an independent researcher when you think about the scholarship. When you think about full now it's a matter of accomplishment, not about promise. And so what does accomplishment look like? It really does matter what your discipline is, what accomplishment looks like. So in education, for example, we may not have as many people who have written books, but they have a lot of empirical research. They have conference presentations that were turned into published articles. They have edited journals by that time. Uh, they have led conference uh, proceedings, uh, etc. They've also become what sometimes is referred to as a good citizen of the university. Because after tenure, you'll be asked, you'll learn more about the colleges and departments you're in, to be on certain committees of your respective department or college or things like grad council, academic senate, and so forth. But the scholarship is a matter of accomplishment, and it just looks different according to each discipline. And so that's why the letters really matter. Uh, if I'm reviewing something in history, I have to depend upon the letter. Somebody might have a book. Is this a good book? The people on the committee won't know. They'll look at the letters. Most of people the people who use it. Well, no, the letters matter for associate also. Um, I'm not saying there's a difference. I'm saying that the, the factors and the difference of disciplines really plays itself, itself out kind of fully at the full level uh, because the disciplines are so different. I mean, you think about music, you think about art, you think about language and history and, uh, and the research groups that the med school are reviewing for. And so you look at your colleagues around the table to help you. Uh, and you look at the letters, and you look at the personal statements. So, leader so, in the field, is that, is that uh, leader in your discipline? I mean, what's, is that the expectation in terms of accomplishment? It's not just more of the same, but something beyond more of the same? Well, there's something more of the same, but I can't define what leader in your discipline looks like. 
there, there's only between the time, for example, that you would be promoted to associate and the time that you would be uh, a full professor in my discipline of psychology, there will only be so many presidents of the American Psychological Association <laughs> and many candidates. So that cannot be the standard. I just wanted to take an opportunity to underscore something I said uh, earlier. Uh, those of you who have never seen it, there's this wonderful parody called, sometimes it's called The Tenure Song, sometimes it's called Their Way, but it's done to the tune of Spike Sinatra's My Way, so it's I Did It Their Way. Um, and it's, among other things, it rhymes, it rhymes full professor with cruel oppressor, so it's great. You should really <laughs> look it up on the internet. But, you know, I, I said earlier that... Um, one of the things that I encourage people to do is to figure out who they are as an academic and do that well. And I think that once you have tenure, you have more freedom to do that. I mean, you still have to do it their way to a certain extent. But look, you know, you, you, you can also try more creative things. You, you, you can do things a little bit differently. And, you know, like I said, if, if you don't get tenure, it, it, it likely means you have to leave the university, if you, especially if you're in your seventh year. Um, if you don't get promoted to full, you can continue doing what you're doing, and so there's a little bit more freedom and flexibility there, um, which is, again, one of the great things about getting tenure in the first place, is you have that freedom and flexibility. Hey, I mean, you, you're a full professor also. Do you want to add any? Uh, yeah, I was hired with tenure when I came to Wayne, so it was kind of like exceptional because I had a tenure position in the Netherlands before I came here. Um, and I had two books, and like, I'm in a book discipline, you need to have a book in order to get Normally, like two books is enough to be promoted to full professor, but when, uh, well, my chairman gave me to understand that I had to kind of actually show that I could write yet another book um, because they started counting really my research from the moment they hired me, uh, which in a way makes sense. It was also a good incentive to write another book. But yeah, in, in, in my department, in my discipline generally, you just have to write another book. You just really need another book. It's not enough to have a bunch of articles or book chapters you need in other books in English, and I think in most of the humanities generally, uh, they're book disciplines. And, um, and that's not always easy because everybody knows that it's not easy to get like a book published at all because most of the publishers have merged into big conglomerates and it's very much hard to find uh, a publisher. Uh, but it's still very much an old school rule in, in the humanities that you need to have published a book. Preferably, of course, when you go up from, from associate to, to full, you know, then need a bunch of articles and chapters and whatnot, but the book is really kind of the key kind of piece of evidence to show that you have accomplished what you need to accomplish in order to qualify as a full professor. I, I want to add two more things to uh, my comments. Uh, one is about citations, which your work cited. When you come up for associate, uh, in tenure, frankly, your work hasn't been out there that long. And so people don't generally look at citations of your work in the same way that we will when you're going up for fall, because your work has been out more and should be cited. The other is grants. If you're in a discipline where you ought to be able to compete for grants and be successful, it matters. It matters a lot, because if you haven't been successful, that's interpreted as meaning something. But not every discipline has grants available to them. And so the university committee, and I believe the internal committees of where the, that, that department is held, understand those things. And you have to look at different things for the recognition of the advancement and accomplishment. But if you're in a discipline that has grants available, um, before we open up the questions, Bob, you want to? If I just pick up, because several people mentioned that the letters, the external letters from the external reviewers are very important. And they are. They really are important. Uh, sometimes on the university committee, I remember trying to read somebody in Romance Languages and it was a poet. And this was difficult. And I had to read the letters. I tried reading the poems, but my French and Spanish were of such ancient, you know, it wasn't any good. Uh, so, so a reviewer looks at your body of work. You, and when you fill out your, your portfolio, you're going to have 
terms of teaching in your research portfolios, for example. In your research portfolio, you should be setting out the, the argument that says, no, I don't have just 42 separate papers that make no connection. There are actually variations on the theme. I'm making an argument, a long argument about this certain hypothesis. Or if you split, you did you invested question one here and question two over here. That should be, you should be laying out your diagram that guides the reviewers. They may disagree with you if your, your logic isn't well, but you can help guide them. This is how I see my career. I've been, I've been investigating this and I do this. And this piece over here relates to this. It's, I mean, you should be able to draw that out in some kind of argument. The letter, the, your research document and your teaching document, because teaching does count. Um, it's not as important as the research, clearly. But there is this emphasis to teach well. There's many people who do active learning and have learned about it. And there's also the university's need for retention. And it's a political, national political need for retention of, of, of students. These are too important to be thrown away casually. Yeah? And when you, so you should spend some time on, that, on each of those portfolios. If you can't describe your research to me, then how am I supposed to make sense of it? Okay, and that's, that's important. I think you have to spend a lot of time on that. The same thing with the teaching portfolio. I don't, know if, sorry, I don't know if all departments do this, but we in philosophy, as a matter of course, when we send out the materials to external reviewers, we include all of the, the papers, we include the CV, and we also include the personal statement, because we see the personal statement as a way for the candidate to sort of give a, an overview and coherent picture of, of what they're up to. I think it's a good idea. One final point. I remember one case from a long time ago. Part of the portfolio has a miscellaneous. You can put extra material in if you want. Know. It's not covered by any other tab. And there was a, in one case, there was a 100-page article tucked in there. But it wasn't by the person. And, I couldn't, and it had not much to do with the topic, and I didn't understand why this was here. And it bothered me until I finally, many hours later, figured out that the person who submitted this had been cited in this 100-page paper once. <laughs> uh, this, I was not in a pleasant mood after figuring that out. <laughs> do not, do not pad this with other with stuff. Yeah, your citations are important. You don't have to read the damn things. Let's open it up to questions. We have uh, about 15 minutes or so, and of course you have a chance to meet with the panelists afterwards as well. But are there questions from, from uh, any of the audience? Yes. Renee mentioned that she had been tenured elsewhere Sometimes we're lucky enough to be able to search for senior personnel, bring them in at associate or full professor level. How does the process work at that point? Do we require them to go through a full review here at Wayne State, or can we bring them in based on their credentials established elsewhere? I still had to go through that, that even though they hired me with tenure, I still had to provide all my materials. It was like a kind of one tenure case. Does it include yes. external reference letters, etc.? Anything in the contract that governs that? No. Yeah. They just asked me for, like, you know, I went to the committee, read my books, uh, read my work, read my, my CV. Uh, it wasn't as extensive a package as I had to prepare to. The, there isn't, uh, there's no firm rule that uh, the, uh, the, the offer can hire an administrator usually there. They're hired with tenure. They usually are, are referred to the department and they give a presentation in the department and, and the department usually concedes the votes for tenure. It's not the same, anything like the same formal pro process. We had one process, uh, this is sort of a non sequitur, but we had one process where we were hiring a new provost and uh, it was about 15 years ago and under, the, under a previous president whose name we show not mention. The, uh, and uh, the, the department to whom the provost would, the, the provost would be, he'd been tenured at two other places. Uh, they have voted him tenure, but the president refused to give him tenure. He said he didn't want his provost tenure. Fortunately, that attitude is faded. In our college, and I gather for one of them it's not contractual, but the dean will present the credentials of the candidate to our personnel committee for its recommendation in concurrence if the dean is recommending. But the dean is not obligated to follow the committee's recommendation. Yeah. Just one point. The, the tenure process is also in the, the, the statute of the Board of Governors. And we have Board of Governors that are elected statewide.
statewide to provide policy direction and everything to the university. And they approve of certain statutes. So for a long time, we've had things within the statute that speak directly to how promotion and tenure is supposed to be handled. And it works in tandem with the contract. So you might want to also check there. And I don't think there's any prohibitions or regulations that they cannot hire with tenure from outside of the, you know, hire someone outside with tenure if they so desire to do it. There's no restrictions on them for doing it. But I'm just saying there's another source of information besides what's in the contract. Do we have time for maybe one or two more questions? I have a question. I'm stuck with the associate professor on that one. I've been there for years. And I always was naive enough to think that when somebody nominates you for promotion and tenure, I was promoted within four years, five years early. And then the next time, I think our chair at the time, he did it in two sets, a promotion to associate and then see what you do as associate. And then the next year was tenure. So and that was done within under the seven years, which we all got. And I was productive. I did service in the department, university. In fact, before I'm still an associate, I was on the university committee for promotion and tenure. And I remember the long hours and reading. And now I'm stuck. And I know that one of the previous associate professors who was associate chair, he wanted to promote me to full. I had a World Health Organization grant. And it fell through. I don't know why. And now I don't have money. And I did talk with my chair once. And he says, well, now you don't have money. But what was wrong with not promoting me earlier? Because I had NIH grants. I had American Cancer Society grant. I had American Heart Association muscular dystrophy. I mean, I wrote a lot of grants. The question is now I'm stuck because I have shoestring money from the university. And I haven't published. I know I have to publish. So when I talk, well, you need money. You know, you can't get money unless you can do the research. So it's like a vicious circle. And I don't know if there's any hope or if there is a better approach for me to go and talk to outside the chair. Let me put this in a broader context and maybe somebody can comment on this. Excuse me. And my question was, if you go off the board, don't they look at the whole years, your career here, how much you've done, not just the last three years? No, they actually do look. That's why I pointed this out. Even though I have good tenure, they look at my case for promotion for the period of time that I've been at Wayne. My productivity during that period after I was, no, just the period after I was hired with tenure. So they don't go back necessarily, even though they assume that there's a basis for, you know, the kind of work that you've done as an associate professor. But really they focus on have you actually kind of, as Steve said earlier, have you kind of fulfilled that promise that they kind of support when they grant you tenure in the first place? So I can kind of imagine the process within my department because I know the people. But I'm kind of feeling, I would like to know more about the college committee and the university committee. And also I'm trying to think things I will write in my statement for addressing that level. So people can say more things about that. More college or? College or university. What college are you in? Arts and sciences. Arts and sciences. Okay, I've been on the college and the classes committee for some time. And I think the first, almost everybody who served on the committee knows, paid a lot of attention. And looked at people individually, not comparative cases. It's always a worry if two or three people are coming up from the same department. And not only is it people didn't do it, but one person did try with an administrator. 
chair the, the dean vice dean and associate dean of the academic unit said, no, you can't do it. You cannot do it. These are entire packages, individual packages. And you take them as they are. And one person will be a little better than another in some other thing, but that's not what we're comparing. We're looking at this person. Can they be a good associate professor or something like that? Not how good, you know, are they good enough? Not, not doing the comparison. And I think people work very hard to make, to look at those records. You spend a lot of time in this vigorous debate back and forth. So if you have done your, your, your personal statement, your portfolio, everything, you've gotten your data down in the right way. So it's clear. And, then, and you can point out the questions you ask, what they've done, where you're going, where the difficulty is, or whatever. Uh, and you can have other people read it over for you. But if you've laid out that material there, then um, it makes it for an easier debate. There is always a debate, some discussion. And the discussion often will, is on the probability. And so, and that can get to be a, a close thing. It's not just counting the dollars, though. And this biology, it, 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 you can get grants and all that, although it's getting harder. But, but people recognize that. And so people are looking at the quality of the papers and how they're receiving what they do. Does that help you? Anyway? So that's the kind of the college. And the college level, I think, they gave... And there's a diversity of things that came from the class committee, from romance languages to, to calculus. And, uh, and there was always a debate. It may not be the same people debating, but there's always a debate and a discussion. Um, and sometimes carry over to the next meeting type of thing to think about things. I don't think there's a bunch on, on that, a long experience. There is a limit to what it is that the contract can lay out. Contract layout lays out procedures, fairs, consideration, and so on. The decision as to whether or not to put a person up is a departmental decision. It calls for up to for tenure, it calls for a two thirds vote by the tenured faculty. Now, there are academic politics being what it is, there are high variations among the various departments and so on, but all we can do is try to make it as transparent and as fair in procedural terms as possible. But there's no way the union certainly can substitute its academic value, its academic uh, decision for someone in English or biology or somewhere else. That really is up to the department. If it's a weak department and it doesn't make good arguments and so on, that weakens the candidates. But if it's a strong department, often the, the, the department's given a, a sort of a that's expected from that department, and it moves along. But there is there is a high, there is a variation from the department to department. For example, in English, uh, the department chair was interpreting uh, rules that don't really exist beyond probably the uh, chair's mind, <laughs> and uh, and so they can't do much about that sort of thing. I, I would add. Um, I mean, it just, just points to the, one of the things about this whole process, why it's so fraught with anxiety for candidates. I think we all need to remember this. Because so much of it happens behind closed doors. And so much, you know, once you do your part, once you assemble your package, once you send your stuff, then you sit and wait. And even if you had the strongest case in the world, I mean, you know, when I, when I went up for full a year or so ago, I had people telling me, you're fine, it's a shoe interview. And you're, you still know that behind closed doors, people are talking about you, and there's nothing you can do about it. And, and that doesn't feel good. Um, uh, just know that other people are in that boat too. And, and the best thing is to try to focus on your own part and then keep yourself busy w w during that waiting period, which usually lasts, you know, all the way till the very end of April. Yes. But no, actually, we, you were out of the room when I talked about this. But I, 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 I mentioned the fact that we do have very good, including. Uh, for, for mental health care, and I, I encourage people to take advantage of those when, when necessary. Yeah. So let me uh, ask you uh, any closing statement. You know, I want to open the door for him on what it looks like inside the room <laughs> at the <laughs> university <laughs> level. Okay. It's clouds of smoke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have uh, mystics who come in yeah. and <laughs> help us with these decisions because <laughs> they're so complicated. <laughs> so you're going to have about 12 to 13 senior faculty from around the university looking at your documents. So to put you a little bit 
more at ease and a little bit less anxious. In those documents are the letters from the various faculty committees supporting you and the parallel administrative committee supporting you and all the outside letters where almost all of them, routinely most always all of them, have supported you coming to this committee. You won't care while we're sitting at home reading them. But when we talk about it, you probably don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> how, how bad is one bad net, though? I mean, how, how much of a deadly thing is a, is a, is a bad net? Uh, a lukewarm net. Well, a, lu- a lukewarm letter has to have foundation to it. <laughs> it can't just be somebody spouting off about how marvelous his or her record is and somebody else's doesn't compare. Okay. And so the other letters help balance, number one. But also Plus, you have right. senior people reading these things that know it's, it's how to interpret them. That's right. Not that it's on the committee, it's a little more What is there in the file that justifies it? To justify it. Yeah. So really, the committee is on your side. We can actually yeah. all walk. But it's but not it, the, I, I wish you had a committee on the side, but in fact, the uh, president's designated. Well, the, 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 the committee is a recommending committee. Yes. Oh, that, it is. That, in that sense, in the sense that you're, like you said, an ad, you're, on, you're on the candidate's side to, in, in a general sense. No, the committee, will, the committee will take a vote. Sir, please, uh, can you just a quick question? Yeah, but I just want to answer oh, this, this one piece. The committee will take a vote. Whatever that vote is, is a recommendation to the administration. Yes. I was just going to ask, I think we're hearing the importance of the letters and that the outside reviewers see the body of your work. And yet, we're only focusing on what's been done since one arrives at Wayne State. So I'm wondering whether, for someone like me with 25 years of work before I entered academia, if the body of work that goes out to my reviewers then is the full body of my work. I'd certainly want them to consider that when they were writing about me. And is that the way it goes. What discipline are you in? What college? Uh, I'm, I'm in the theater department. Jack. And so you had a career in the yeah. field beforehand? Yeah. That you want to long to sure. sure. And, and yet, you know, we hear two things, things, that the body works important, but that you're only going to look at what's going on right now. That is no, not, that's, that's not, that's not part of the That's not true. It's not right now. But if you look at what I've been like track record for the last six to eight years, like since we became a personal statement, they look at your portfolio, they look at your uh, teaching philosophy, all these things come into the picture, but um, there is, there is, it's an extra step, right, to, to, to move from associate, from the associate level to full, so you have to show that you've done something more, but like, that makes perfect sense, right, so it's not as if they kind of completely erase what you've done before, but the focus is on what, what legitimates the elevation of this person from this level to that level right. on the basis of what they've been doing since they achieved uh, tenure on this level. Oh, no, I understand that going full. I'm just talking about growing up for tenure. I think the first time going I think that again, Einstein, tenure, Princeton, we really recognize what he's done earlier. I guess so, <laughs> too. Yeah. Yeah. So where you would put that, uh, your suggestion is to make sure that's in your, well, it's going to be on your CV. Yeah, and, your CV. and then and maybe in your narrative statement as well. You can show me about it. Show me your narrative statement. You have to yes. bring out the connection. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I heard you know, your narrative statement and your past stuff by the end of the first page. <laughs> Don't go further with what you've done before. You must concentrate on what, on what well, you're doing or have been doing at Wayne State. And that... Um, so I, it's just advice I'm getting. Yeah, from I, 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 I think the emphasis on what's been done since you came to Wayne State is simply to ensure that people didn't come to Wayne State for the purpose of now I'm going to slack off for the rest of my life. Right. I, I don't think it means that you know if you come to Wayne State sort of midstream. Like we've hired people who have been assistant <coughs> professors elsewhere for a few years and then are with us for a few years. And when it t- comes time for them to go up to tenure, we look at their entire record as assistant professors, including what they did before they came here. We just want to make sure that they didn't come here and then decide to, to you know, slack off. Right. But I mean, I can see someone making the argument that we hired you because of that past work. Now, from now on, we're going to see what you've done until you go up for tenure. But I think 
in your statement, you can reasonably create context for everything you've done at Wayne Stadium by what you've done before coming here. Yeah. And I think that's that takes some creative putting it together, but I think that's worth doing for trying. Closing any closing comments, anyone? Don't feel obligated to do so, but if you want some final words to, to say before we end. I would just say there are a lot of people around who really want to support you and, and are, are rooting for you and, and are behind you. So. And if you have questions or doubts uh, about the process, you can certainly call the AUP office and arrange the conversation or whatever is appropriate. On that note, Renee, Bob, John, Steve, thank you for joining us.